who's behind the hatred of the Jews? Why do people hate the Jewish people so much? What is it about them that they hate? So for this, we're going to start in Psalms chapter 83. And we're going to read verse 1. And this is what it says. O God, be not silent, be not speechless, be not still, O God. See how your enemies rage, how your foes have reared their heads. With cunning they scheme against your people. Okay, here are your people, the Jewish nation, Zion, Jerusalem, the Israelites. And conspired against those you cherish, saying, Come, let us erase them as a nation. May the name of Israel be remembered no more. Now, who says this? Erase them as a nation. Iran. Islam. People that hate the Jewish, even Christians who call themselves Christians, they hate the Jewish nation. Why? What is behind this hatred? This is this intense hatred towards the Jewish uh, people. We're going to find out who's really behind it. Okay. So here it says in verse 5, For with one mind they plot together, they form an alliance against you. So this is interesting. So to be against uh, Israel, right? So to be against Israel right here, to be against Israel is to be against what? God. Now it doesn't mean that every single Jewish person who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if they die, they will not go to heaven because heaven is only for those who put their trust and faith in Jesus. So regardless if it's a Jewish person or Gentile, if they do not put their trust in Christ, they will be lost. But here the Jewish people is that Jesus is going to fulfill a, a, a prophecy. He's going to come in the second coming and he's going to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords where? in Jerusalem. He's going to fulfill that, that he's going to take the seat of David and fulfill a true king, a king of righteousness for 1,000 years. That's why the Jewish nation is so important, and then that's why Satan hates it so much. Okay, now, so we see here the hatred that uh, they want to wipe out. Let us erase them as a nation. Now, you see that comes from Iran, like I said earlier, from Islam. They hate the Jews that much. Okay, now, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And basically, uh, this is a war that breaks out. Now, this is right in the middle of the Great Tribulation. This is the second half of the three and a half years. So a war broke, uh, a war broke out. So here, all right, let's read verse seven real quick. Then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And here the dragon is Satan himself. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but the dragon was not strong enough. And no longer was any place found in heaven for him and his angels, meaning demons or fallen angels. And the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent, and now here it is, called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Okay, now, basically Satan and his demons go, they try one last time to take over heaven. So Michael and his angels fight against the dragon and his angels. So Satan loses and he gets thrown out of heaven permanently. No more access. So then what happens here? Look how he comes down. It says, uh, verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea. With great fury, the devil has come down to you, knowing he has only a short time. So he knows the moment he gets kicked out of heaven, he has only but a short time. Now he's so furious. Guess who he hates? Look, guess where he, um, he shows his fury to? Check this out. Let's go to... Let's go to verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown to the earth, who does he go after immediately? He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. This is a reference to Israel who brought forth the Messiah, meaning Jesus Christ. Okay, but it says, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle to fly from the presence of the serpent and uh, to her place in the wilderness where she will be, uh, where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time. So, the Jewish people who leave, now you see this in Matthew 24, starting in verse 15, where Jesus says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation in the corner of the temple, referring to the third temple, flee to the mountain, because that's when all hell will break loose. 
And that's the same time where Satan goes to, to heaven to make war. He loses, most likely he goes to the Antichrist, tells the Antichrist, look, we got nothing but a short time. Just tell everybody that you're God, that they need to worship you and receive the mark of the beast, or you're going to kill him. So the first thing he does is he goes straight for the Jewish people because the temple is there and he hates the Jews that much. Now, look what happens here. And then that's where the Antichrist demands everybody to get the mark of the beast or they get killed. Why? Because Satan knows he has but a short time, so he speeds it up. So he goes to the Antichrist and he tells the Antichrist to speed it up. Okay, now verse 15, it says, Then from the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away in the torrent. Meaning when the Jewish people are running to the wilderness, here the water most likely because, and I think in Revelation 17 or 18, it talks about that the woman, the prostitute of Babylon, sits on many waters. And then it says that the waters are many people. So in Revelation, it gives you the symbol of water to mean people. So here most likely, when it says that the, the serpent spewed water like a river, it's, it's, uh, it could be an army, meaning the serpent or Satan sends a great army after the Jewish people who are running away from Jerusalem when the Antichrist is taking over to be, you know, for rescue or to be saved in the wilderness. He sends an army after the Jewish people who are running away. So what happens? But the earth, verse 16, but the earth helped the woman and opened its mouth to swallow up the river that had poured from the dragon's mouth. Well, most likely when the soldiers are going after the Jewish people, God causes an earthquake and kills the, you know, kills the army and protects the Jewish people who are going to go to the wilderness to be saved for the last part of the Great Tribulation. Now, and then look at verse 17. And the dragon was enraged at the woman. Now, who hates the woman? Who hates the Jewish people? Satan. Satan is enraged. He hates them with the passion. So when a Christian, a person that claims to be a Christian, by the way, I'm going to name, um, I was going to name two people, but um, I forgot one of the person's name. I think it's one is Rick Wiles and the other one is Stu Peters. These guys have big platform. They call themselves Christians, but they hate the Jewish nation. That to me is satanic inspired. So to, to say you're a Christian and to hate the Jewish people or the Jewish nation is an oxymoron. You cannot do that because if you hate something that Satan hates, what does that mean? That means that you are in cahoots with Satan, meaning you are doing exactly what he wants you to do. Because if you love what he loves, that means you're doing his bidding, meaning you are just like him. So if Satan loves something and you hate it, that means that now you are against the devil. So you cannot be for Satan. You have to be against them. So to hate the Jewish people is to do exactly what Satan wants you to do because Satan hates them with a passion. And I'm going to show you why Satan hates the Jewish people so bad. I'm going to show you this. Okay. So, and then look at verse 17. It says, and the dragon was enraged at the woman, which we already talked about, and went to make, and went to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Meaning, through the Jewish nation, you got Gentile believers. Not only do you got Messianic Jews who are all over the place, but you also have Gentile believers. Meaning, um, because remember, the gospel came from the Jewish people. Like Jesus says uh, to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, for salvation is from the Jews. Meaning that the Messiah, Jesus himself, is Jewish. He came from the stock of Abraham to fulfill prophecy, to die not only for the Jewish nation, but to die for the world. Because Jesus wants to save everybody. All those who put their trust in him, he's going to give them eternal life because that's what he wants. He wants people to give their, their hearts and mind to him for eternal life. So here, when you see here the rest of her children, most likely it's a reference that because of the Jewish nation bringing the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Many people, Jews and Gentiles alike, are um, meaning they hold to the testimony of Jesus, meaning they are believers. So then what does Satan hate? He hates the Jewish people and he hates Christians. Okay, now I'm going to show you why Satan hates Zion, why he hates the Jewish nation, why he hates Jerusalem. Like you heard what happened this week and how Hamas went and slaughtered 900 people, innocent people. These people are driven by demons. These people who did that are possessed by demonic spirits. Only 
a non-human, when, when you say a non-human or an animal did this atrocity, reg, a regular person doesn't do that. A regular person doesn't act like that. That tells you that these people are possessed by demonic spirits. That's how much they hate the Jewish nation. They hate them with a passion. Now, why? Okay, let's go to the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah shows the second coming of Jesus when he fights Antichrist. Now, it doesn't say Antichrist, but when you link this to Revelation chapter 19, it literally shows you the Antichrist where Jesus opens up his mouth and a sword comes out and kills everybody, takes the Antichrist, the false prophet alive, and throws him into the lake of fire. Now, the sword that comes out of the, uh, that comes, um, out of the mouth of Jesus, the sword in Scripture is always, always defined as the Word of God. So that means that Jesus speaks a word and everybody drops dead. That's how powerful Jesus is. Okay, so then here in Zechariah 14, is showing you this part when when the second coming of jesus come he's going to fight against an army that's attacking israel which is antichrist and he's going to destroy them and you're going to see what happens and this is why satan wants to eradicate completely destroy israel um from the map now watch so here let's start in verse one behold a day of the lord is coming when your plunder will be divided in your presence for i will gather all the nations for battle against jerusalem and the city will be captured the houses looted and the women ravished half of the city will go into exile but the rest of the people will not be removed from the city so here god allows the lord allows an army to invade Jerusalem, most likely is the Antichrist. This is a reference to the second coming, so it's the Antichrist. This is not, we cannot mistake this with Ezekiel 38 39, which is Gog and Magog. This is when, this is in reference to to um, um, to the Antichrist, because here it's going to talk about when Jesus comes down physically. So this has to be about that, the Antichrist. So then it says here, verse 3, Then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet, look at this, will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives was split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving to the north and half to the south. So we see here that Jesus physically comes down from heaven and touches the mountain, meaning he comes down in a horse from heaven with the saints, defeats Antichrist, and then he lands, and then he gets off, I'm assuming, from the horse and lands on the Mount of Olives and it splits. Now, why? Why is Jesus coming? Not only to defeat the Antichrist, but what for? Okay, so we're going to skip all this. And and I would encourage you guys to read the whole chapter of Zechariah 14. But since there's a lot of information, I'm just going to skip. And let's go to let's go to verse 16. It says, Then all the survivors from the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And should any of the families of the earth not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, then the rain will not fall on them. And if the people of Egypt will not go up to and enter in, then the rain will not fall on them. This will be the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle. On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots in the house of the Lord will be like the sprinkling bowls before the altar. Indeed, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts. And all the sacrifice will come and take some, oh, I'm sorry, and, and all who sacrifice will come and take some pots and cook in them. And on that day, there will be, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So basically, what this is saying is Jesus comes in the second coming. He's going to be Lord of Lord and King of Kings in Jerusalem. He's going to rule there for 1,000 years. And then all the nations need to come and respect and give honor to the king of kings who created them. And if they do not do that, he will not send them rain, meaning they will not have any water or food. Because without rain, you can't grow any crops and you can't have water. You know, you will have famine. So here Jesus will rule and fulfill the prophecy of, of um, I think it's in Daniel chapter 2 where you got the statue that Nebuchadnezzar was dream, you know, that he had a dream about, a rock hits the feet and everything gets destroyed and then a kingdom is, is you know, erected. 
And that's in reference to the second coming, meaning to the millennial reign of Christ. So now here, really quickly, we'll go to, to Revelation 20. Revelation 20, and it says here, so this is why, see, this is why Satan wants to eradicate Jerusalem. Because if you do not have Israel, if you do not have Jerusalem, then what happens is, how can Jesus come and fulfill prophecy if there's nothing there to fulfill? Meaning if the Jewish people is not there, how he's going to be the Jewish Messiah? How is he going to fulfill, you know, what he prophesied that a king in the line of David will come and reign in righteousness and true righteousness? How are you going to have that? And plus, what's going to happen to Satan when Jesus comes here? This is what's going to happen to Satan. Look at this. Look at verse 1 of Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss, holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, Satan, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive the nations until the thousand years were complete. After that, he must be released for a brief uh, period of time. So Satan, when Jesus comes to rule for the thousand years at the second coming, Satan gets locked up into the abyss for 1,000 years. Why do you think Satan wants to destroy Israel out of the map? Why he wants to kill all the Jews? Because Satan doesn't want to be in prison for a thousand years. He doesn't want Jesus to rule for 1,000 years. Satan and all his demons will be locked away. No more demonic influence, no more occultic practices, no more atheism. Why? Because an atheist can say, God doesn't exist. I don't see him. Well, just when Jesus comes, go go, go to Jerusalem and you're going to see God in, God in Jerusalem. So atheism will disappear. Occultic practices will be gone. Everything that people do that was influenced by demonic spirits, since they're going to be locked up, no, you know, it's not going to work anymore. That's going to be eradicated. So Satan doesn't want that. Satan loses a war in heaven, and then he's going to get locked up. So that's why. So Satan has in his mind, if the Jewish people do not exist, if I erase the Jewish nation, then Jesus cannot come down and lock me up for a thousand years, and I will still take over this planet. That is Satan's mentality. But guess what? It's not going to happen. Why? Because the Word of God will stand. The Word of God everything that the word of god says will happen jesus will come with the saints jesus will rule on earth for 1000 years of as lord of lords and king of kings satan will be locked up for 1000 years and then after that brief moment he's going to deceive a whole bunch of people again they're going to come against jerusalem fire will come down from heaven destroy them all and then that's when satan will be guess what he will be cast into the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Him and his fallen angels will burn forever. They're going to go to their permanent state, to their final destination forever and ever. And then after the thousand years, Jesus will create a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to live with angels, with Jesus and a new planet. Uh, the Father, the Son are going to be in the new city of Jerusalem. They're going to be our light. No more sun, moon, or stars. It's going to be all beautiful and bright with Jesus and the Father as our light. And we're going to be in true righteousness. We're going to be completely like He wants us to be with Him for all eternity. So now you know who hates the Jewish people. So remember, Rick Wiles, be careful. That man is not a Christian. He is a false Christian. And Stu Peters, the same thing. These people hate the Jewish nation. And if you hate the Jewish nation, why? It's because you are not a believer. You cannot hate what Satan hates and think that you love Jesus Christ. If you go against the word of God and are in cahoots with Satan, then what does that make you? That doesn't make you a Christian. That makes you a demonic follower. So we must understand and we must read God's word and we must learn to love the things God loves and hate the things God hates because we are here in a spiritual warfare and we must fight the good fight. How? By putting on the full armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 and walking according to the Holy Spirit, obeying the word of God, praying and seeking the Lord and living a life that pleases Jesus Christ until 
Jesus comes to rapture his church. And when he does, we will never leave his side. We will always be with him. Maranatha. Thank you for listening.